Neville George Cleverly Heath was born on the 6th of June 1917 in Ilford, Essex. His parents, William, a hard-working middle-class man, and Beatrice, or Betty as she was known, were loving parents. In 1920, the family moved across London to Merton in south-west London. Betty was expecting their second child, and on September the 5th, Bessie gave birth to another son, Carol William Cleverly Heath. Unfortunately, in 1923, aged two, the young child passed away. Understandably, the family were devastated. Betty, it's been said, became more focused on Neville. Throughout Heath's life, he would maintain a close relationship with his mother. He frequently wrote letters to her and visited her often. It is believed that Beatrice may have been the only person who knew about Heath's dark tendencies and may have enabled his behaviour by providing him with money and support. Heath's behaviour had been learnt from a young age, soon realising that he could get away with almost anything in his parents' eyes. As a young child, he was caught stealing a cake and ran when he had been spotted. Another time, his parents found some small items he had stolen in his pockets. He went on to admit he didn't really want them, he just wanted to take them. His parents were adamant they had chastised him when he misbehaved, but not many people believed that. In 1928, Bessie gave birth to another son, Mick. By 1932, the family moved to a larger property in an idealistic area of middle-class suburbia. They took in paying lodgers with the hope, with the extra money coming in, they could get both their sons to the local grammar school. Rutlish Grammar The school was run by a strict headmaster who believed strongly in corporal punishment. Many of the boys who attended the school felt the wrath of the cane or the belt. It's thought this could have possibly been the catalyst of Heath's future fetish. One thing that stuck with Heath was being told that if you can speak the King's English well and carry yourself with distinction, you would be treated with respect. Put simply, get educated, speak well and you will succeed in life An elocution was drilled into the boys. This impacted Heath so much so he yearned to be part of those he saw as a higher class than himself. So he studied their manner and language eventually being able to insert himself and viciously exploit those who came into his life. The young Neville Heath had all the qualities of an unlikable person. He was a liar, a snob and show-off. But somehow the girls liked him and saw him along the lines of a likeable rogue. But that rogue crossed the line one night after drinking quite a large quantity of beer. 15-year-old Heath attacked a girl and tried to force himself on her. She got away and told her father. Somehow, Heath managed to talk her father out of reporting him to his headmaster using all the charm he had learned from his superiors, showing him once again that he could smooth-talk his way out of almost anything. The young Heath had a keen interest in aviation and dreamed of becoming an officer and a pilot. But as good as he was at sports, he did struggle academically, and he failed his exams. He wouldn't take them again, flatly refusing when his mother tried to encourage him to retake them. So at the age of 16, he started working as a warehouse man at a textile company situated in the city of London. He hated the work, but enjoyed the city life, especially the social life. It wasn't long before he made friends with a group of reasonably affluent former public schoolboys and businessmen who were in the Territorial Army. Wanting a taste of that lifestyle and the status that it offered, he went on to join as a rifleman in the 28th London Regimental Territorial Army. Finally, he had the uniform which gave him the sense of power and the status he had craved for. World War II was looming. The pull of the Royal Air Force was calling to Heath. 
It was what he wanted the most in his life. It was his childhood dream. The RAF had an image of a more relaxed force where former public school boys could join up and still have that camaraderie they once had at their school. Comics and films of the time showed the pilots as dashing young heroic men. It was everything Heath desired. In November 1935, Heath started his RAF training at Desford in Leicestershire. After he learnt to fly in February 1936, he left his warehouse job when he was given a short service commission for four years, doing general duties for the RAF. After passing all the relevant written, medical and verbal tests, he started training as an acting pilot officer at RAF Wittering in Northamptonshire. Once all his training had been completed, Heath earned his wings with an assessment above average, leading him on the road to becoming what all the young pilots wanted, a fighter pilot. In August 1936, Heath was posted to RAF Duxford near Cambridge. It became apparent that Heath had what it took to be a successful pilot. His superiors saw him having the makings of a first-class pilot and an outstanding officer. He had also met a girl called Arlene Blakely, who at the age of 19 he proposed to and got engaged. But Heath's delusions of grandeur would eventually get the better of him. Most of the other officers at the time came from rather affluent families and the RAF pay wouldn't cover their lavish lifestyle, but they were lucky to have the backing of the family money. Heath wanted to be a part of that lifestyle, but financially he couldn't keep up. He was living way beyond his means and by 1937 he was not only in trouble with the bank, but more importantly to him, the RAF where his cheques had been returned due to lack of funds. When Heath was questioned about this, he panicked and ran away, returning to his parents' home in Wimbledon. On June the 22nd, he was arrested by the RAF police for desertion. While awaiting court-martial, he was allowed to roam the aerodrome after giving his word as an officer and a gentleman that he wouldn't run. He broke his word, stole an officer's car and once again took off back to London. He was arrested again and on the 20th of August 1937 at his court martial he was found guilty of going absent without leave. After just one year the young Heath was dismissed from the RAF on the 20th of September 1937. After returning home and borrowing money from his fiancée Arlene, he decided to travel to the Midlands to look for work. Arlene wouldn't see or have anything to do with her intended again. Heath made his way to Nottingham and stayed at the Victoria Hotel under the name of Lord Dudley. The hotel bill went unpaid. He bought clothes with dud cheques, then tried to buy a car from the then landlord of the Sherwood Inn, promising to forward the cheque by post. Heath was arrested at a hotel bar in Nottingham by D.I. Hickman of the CID. At the Nottingham Petty Sessions, he was charged with eight other offences from Cambridge, Peterborough and Stafford. He once again relied upon his charm and told Al his behaviour was wrong and he was terribly sorry for the trouble he had caused to all those concerned, claiming it was because of what had happened with the RAF. He was placed on probation, banned over on remand for two years. His name appeared in the national press with the report stating that he told the DI when caught, I'm Lord Dudley, but not if you're a detective, old man. According to his probation officer through the winter of 1937-1938, Heath showed promise. He mentioned on more than one occasion about all his efforts to find work and stay out of trouble. He also noted the close relationship with his parents, noting how Heath seemed to be able to twist his mother around his little finger and how she seemed to find any excuse she could when he misbehaved. It wasn't long before Heath went off again on a spree of theft and deception. 
in February 1938, a lady caught a cab to Houston Station. In her rush, she left her bag containing some money and blank cheques and some other personal items in the cab. Heath was the next passenger and found the bag. He did no more than spend the cash and use the cheques to fund his deceptive trips across the country. Going under the name of A.J. Bannon, he purchased expensive clothes and lodged in Paddington. He left about a month later and continued his travels while swindling innocent people along the way under the many guises he had. Back in London, he knew his exploits would see him back in court. Once again, he would heavily rely on his good looks, charm and polite manner, hoping that the same strategy he had used before in court would work again. He wrote to Scotland Yard apologising for his behaviour and promising he didn't mean to hurt anyone, offering to pay back all the money he'd stolen or had swindled off people. He asked for leniency and understanding as he would never do any wrong again. At this time, Heath was working at John Lewis, earning just £2 a week. Even this was gained fraudulently and when this was discovered, he was sacked. He was there a mere 13 days. Heath never left his criminal ways. He was a badden, a small town crook who didn't care who he stole from, always expecting to get away with whatever crime he committed with a light reprimand, just as his parents had always done. When appearing at the Old Bailey, the judge showed his disdain when he saw just how many times Heath had thrown away the help his probation officer had given the 21-year-old young man and decided on a more severe sentence. He was given a sentence of three years at Hollersley Bay Borstal for boys in Suffolk. Apparently, his time there at the rural set Borstal was a happy time for Heath. In later years, he would remember it fondly. But then this particular borstal was all about rehabilitation and worked along similar lines to the public school and Heath was very familiar to that routine. He worked outside on the small farm, helping with the animals and tending and picking the fruit and veg from the gardens. He joined in all the outdoor sports they offered and hoped, with his good behaviour, for an early release. Heath made friends with the governor and the head of the Borstal Association while at Hollersley. Cyril Joyce and Mr Scott and these two men would remain friends with Heath and his family for many years. At the start of World War II, Heath was released but had to remain on licence for three years. From the moment he was released, he was determined to be a part of the RAF fighting in the war. He went from one RAF recruiting office to another and was turned down every time. Heath ended up joining the Royal Army Service Corp as a driver. In December 1939, while visiting his parents, he met 24-year-old Peggy Dixon at a dance on the 13th of April 1940 and they became engaged just before Heath went off to war on the 18th. Judging by Heath's letters home, he was an heroic force to be reckoned with. In fact, Heath had once again got in debt, stole and spent time frequenting clubs in Jerusalem and Cairo. It was while there that Heath was allegedly introduced to the Amazon rune, where anything goes. Heath's tastes were, to say the least, violent, if the stories were true. With his lack of respect for the authorities and his financial problems, as well as his constant unauthorised absences, he was once again arrested, court-martialed, found guilty, stripped of his rank and commission and sent back to England disgraced. When the ship that carried disgraced Heath back to England was forced to dock at Durban for repairs, it would set sail again without Heath. Heath wandered around Durban under his new guise as Captain Selway of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders 
and somehow managed to talk Barclays Bank into giving him a loan of £85. Travelling through different cities under different names, leaving hotels with, as usual, unpaid bills. Finding his way to Pretoria, he joined the South African Air Force under the names of James Robert Cadogan Armstrong, giving another fantastical story of his non-existent heritage. But it worked to his advantage as he met 22-year-old Elizabeth Hardcastle Rivers, a beautiful woman who was as sporty as Heath, well-educated and had an affluent family who disapproved of the relationship. So they eloped and married on the 12th of February 1942, after breaking of his engagement to Peggy. By September 1942, Elizabeth gave birth to their son in Johannesburg. Heath was now enjoying his life and his work as a flying teacher. He was popular and was often seen socialising. He apparently seemed settled and happy, but the South African CID were on his case and his whole life was about to be exposed. Not only was he an illegal in the country, but he was a fraud, a liar and a thief. His court martial would be revealed. His new life started to crumble at his feet. His future was now in the hands of the South African Air Force. He made an impassioned plea to the Director General of the SAAF, asking them to take into account that he had a good record with them. It worked and he was again given another chance after someone, maybe his father-in-law, paid his debts off. His biggest ambition was to get back into the RAF in England, so applied for a transfer. He succeeded and went back to England. He was partnered with a very distinguished Captain Fielding Johnson, who would go on to witness Heath's unreliability and heavy drinking. Reports from crew members about Heath's behaviour left Fielding Johnson with even more concerns. Fielding Johnson's concerns lessened when Heath showed exemplary behaviour whilst in action one night when the bomber he was piloting was hit. Heath's ability to pilot wasn't in question, it was his behaviour when in drink and in social circles that concerned the captain. Whatever happened with Heath and Johnson led to Fielding Johnson reporting his behaviour to his squadron commander. Heath would never fly in the RAF again. He returned to South Africa where his troubles continued when his wife asked him for a divorce. An apparent shattered Heath tried to talk her out of the decision, but she was adamant. It was said that it was down to his excessive drinking, womanising and general financial problems. Heath's lawyers and psychiatrists would later blame his murderous ways on the breakdown of his marriage. May 1945, the war was now over and Heath was AWOL. He was now calling himself General Armstrong and booked into a hotel in Cape Town. And once again, the con man, under different names, went from city to city, hotel to hotel, leaving unpaid bills behind him. After more bank withdrawals, it wasn't long before the authorities were after him. The RAAF threatened him with a court-martial. It would be a third for going AWOL but was handed over to the civil police first. He was found guilty of fraud and given two sentences of hard labour or a fine suspended for two years on condition he paid off his debts. His estranged wife apparently bailed him out. At his court-martial he had 11 charges against him. He was found guilty on all charges and dismissed from the service placed in police detention to be deported back to England. It would come to light that while Heath was home in England and still married, he met a woman called Zeta Williams. He asked her to marry him, telling her he was getting a divorce from his wife in South Africa. When he returned to South Africa, he wrote back to Zeta, telling her his wife wouldn't divorce him, so the engagement was off. 
A devastated Zeta found she was expecting his child and wrote to Heath, informing him of her situation. He wrote back with the address of a clinic. Zeta's father found out and the Williams family reported Heath for breach of promise. When Heath was deported back to England in 1946, he booked himself into the Strand Palace Hotel. Out of the blue, Zeta received a letter from him asking her to come to the hotel. She refused and asked her father to tell him to stay away from her. It was probably a lucky escape as 11 days later, Heath was asked to leave the hotel when he was caught in his room with Pauline Breeze who he had tied up, punched and thrashed. Wimbledon police were already on alert for Heath as he had claimed once again to be an officer, wore a uniform and went by the name Armstrong. This time he was arrested, charged and fined £5 for wearing a uniform with the intent to gain money. Heath, it would seem, made another effort to plan his future, heavily financed by his father. He applied for a B licence flying course that would qualify him to fly passenger and cargo planes. Around this time he met 20 year old Jill Harris. At first she declined his attention but later after bumping into him again she went with him to the flying club where he took her up in a plane. When she saw him the next day he bought her flowers. She wouldn't see him again for about a week. He's contacted Jill and she was happy as it was the weekend. They arranged to meet at the hotel for lunch. They spent most of the day together and that night they watched the fireworks at the park. But the night would end badly when something happened between Jill and Heath. It's not publicly known what happened but it was possibly some sort of rough unwanted attention from Heath. After this incident he was seen with a number of women and didn't contact Jill again. Heath was informed he wouldn't get his B licence to fly as a commercial pilot due to his dismissal from the RAF. He begged for another chance but it was over. On Saturday June the 15th, Heath while at a bar and still reeling from the news, he met a journalist called Harry Ashbrook. Heath went on to tell him he was going to fly planes abroad and was going to fly to Copenhagen to discuss purchasing some planes for a flying club there. As it turned out, Ashbrook was also flying to Copenhagen and Heath put forward that he could fly him there cheaper if he hires a plane. Ashbrook took Heath's word and Heath continued to spin his usual nonsense. The next day Heath went to lunch with Yvonne Simmons, a woman he'd met the previous night. They spent the night together and he saw her off on the Monday evening. Heath's mother said her son was home on the Monday night and left at 8.30am Tuesday morning. As Heath hadn't told his parents about not being able to get his B licence, they thought he was arranging his trip abroad. He didn't go home Tuesday night. Wednesday morning Heath called his mother and told her he'd passed his B licence. Arriving home he collected some belongings, kissed his mother and left. The next day, Heath met Ashbrook, who introduced Heath to an acquaintance of his, Leslie Terry, a restaurant owner and apparently a criminal. Heath talked Ashbrook into borrowing some money to pay for the plane from Terry. Terry obliged and Ashbrook gave Heath £30 of the £50 cash. Ashbrook left, leaving Heath and Terry to continue drinking heavily at a couple of clubs. Eventually, Heath joined a woman he knew. Marjorie Gardner. Terry eventually left and Heath and Marjorie went for dinner. Marjorie was, it was said, a little promiscuous. She and Heath slept together. It was said Marjorie had indulged in the same fetish Heath enjoyed. This was disputed by her family and friends, stating she had no interest in fetishes. The couple hailed a taxi that took them to the Pembridge Court Hotel, where Heath had been staying. The drunken pair went up to Heath's room. The next day, the hotel chambermaid, who had waited longer than usual for the handsome man in room 4 to wake up, was told to knock on the door before entering. After no reply, she pushed the door open. It was dark, but she could make out the shape of someone on the bed. 
Looking closer, she saw a woman face down on the bed, her bare back cut with deep bloody marks and her hair soaked in blood. The chambermaid ran calling for help. The hotel manager, Alice Wyatt, entered the room. She was horrified by the sight before her. On entering, Police Sergeant Averill established Marjorie's identity and called for backup. Superintendent Cheryl and Inspector Sims arrived at the scene. Dr Keith Simpson, the home office pathologist, determined she had been killed around midnight or in the early hours. Now it was around 12.15 when Heath and Marjorie arrived back at the hotel. Marjorie's injuries would be described as appalling by Simpson and he concluded in his report that the flagellation had started off as consensual but the beating escalated into a frenzied mutilation. There were teeth marks in her breasts. Her body and face were cut and bruised. Her throat also showed heavy bruising. There were lash marks on her skin that looked as if a whip had been used on her, front and back, face and head. Marks around her wrists showed she had been tied up. The worst wound was found to be where an object had been inserted inside her lower area. Dr Simpson put calls of death as suffocation as it was likely it happened when her head was pushed face down into the pillow. The handsome rogue was now seen as a sadistic killer. As Heath had actually used his real name at the hotel, the hunt for Heath was now on. With D.I. Reg Spooner leading the case, with Superintendent Barrett assisting, all the intel they received and gathered on the once petty fraudster helped them to paint a picture of the man they believed was responsible for this horrific crime. Heath and Marjorie's movements were confirmed for that night from witnesses and a record of Heath's treatment of women from his many exploits was also being built. From making promises of marriage to get what he wanted to his fetish, one hotel, the Strand, giving them the details of how they had to dismiss him from the room for beating a screaming woman with a cane. With around 50,000 police out searching, all Heath's usual haunts were under surveillance, including his parents' home. Meanwhile, after leaving the hotel on that Friday morning, Heath made his way to Worthing, where Yvonne Simmons lived. After checking into the Ocean Hotel, he met Simmons for lunch. Heath gave her a story about how he was indirectly involved with the death of the lady, as it was the same room they, he and Yvonne, had shared a few days before. He told her he had loaned the room to a man who had asked if he could use it to entertain a woman. He would later claim that Marjorie had asked him if she could use the room to entertain a man. He went on to tell Yvonne that the police had taken him to see the body and told her of the gruesome sight he saw and that the policeman had informed him she had been suffocated. All the details he gave her could only have been known by the pathologist, the police and the killer. The next day Heath's name appeared in all the papers and Yvonne saw it. After talking with her parents, who it said were very concerned, she spoke with Heath over the phone. Heath, of course, told her he needed to head to London to clear this whole matter up, but before he did, he wrote one of his usual letters trying to blame someone else and trying to claw himself out of another, although more serious, crime. He gave a description of a man called Jack, who he believed was a friend of Marjorie, that they needed to talk to, and he sent it to Superintendent Barrett. Heath had to leave now Yvonne's parents knew where he was. Arriving in Bournemouth, he checked his suitcase that contained the instrument that he'd beaten Marjorie with into the cloakroom at the station. He checked into the Tollard Royal Hotel under the name Group Captain Rupert Brooke. As his picture hadn't been published yet, he managed to stay incognito for a while, drinking, dancing and making new friends. One in particular was Peter Ryler, a demobbed lawyer, who he would befriend, 
and while the police continued their search, Heath and Rylet parted. By now his pockets were almost empty, but that never seemed to worry him. He had been conning his way through life for years. While in Bournemouth, Heath would take a keen interest in a woman, Peggy Weirin, who he became friends with, so much so he asked her to marry him again. She obviously refused. She refused his advances on more than one occasion. Peggy would claim that at times, Heath, who she knew as Brooks, became intense when he held her hand and became quite rough with her before controlling himself again. Peggy had decided to leave Bournemouth to the dismay of Heath, but she was adamant she was going and left for London. It would also seem quite odd that he changed his room at the hotel to a cheaper room on the second floor with a gas fire. It was also situated directly over the main entrance. It was now 10 days since Marjorie's body had been discovered. On the 3rd of July, Heath met the attractive Doreen Marshall, who was in Bournemouth recovering from a bad case of flu. They spent some time together, ate lunch and later dinner at the Tollard Royal Hotel, and of course Heath drank heavily. According to Heath, later that night, Doreen said she was leaving, but he managed to persuade her to stay a little longer. They then went outside and sat on a seat overlooking the sea. According to someone at the hotel, Doreen looked pale and a little distressed. She did, however, ask a hotel guest to get her a taxi, but Heath told him it wouldn't be necessary as he would walk her back to the hotel. When leaving, Heath told the night porter it would be back in 30 minutes, but Doreen snapped back, no, he'll be 15. At 4.30am, the hotel night porter noted that the captain hadn't returned. The next morning, the porter took the newspapers to Heath's room and was a little confused to see him in his bed. How had he managed to get past the porter? Heath laughed as he told the porter how he'd played a joke on him. The porter assumed later that Heath must have climbed up the builder's ladder that had been propped up against the outside wall to enter the first floor and went from there up to his room on the second. This morning he had a scarf around his neck and paid for his drinks with cash which they found unusual because he had always put his drinks on his bill. The Norfolk Hotel had noticed that Doreen hadn't been seen that morning and after a while decided to call the police as all her belongings were still in her room but Doreen Marshall was missing. The proprietor of the Norfolk Hotel called the Tollard Royal Hotel and inquired about Miss Marshall as he had been told she was going there for dinner the previous Wednesday. This wasn't confirmed until later when Doreen's father called the hotel himself looking for some information on his missing daughter. The manager recalled the young lady with Heath, Brooks, and spoke to Heath who denied that it was the woman they were looking for. He was advised to speak with the police as a woman was missing. Heath, or should I say Group Captain Brooks, did just that. He spoke to DC Souter and later went to the station. When there, he looked at a photo of Doreen and confirmed he had had dinner with her. Heath then told them she had mentioned going away with an American GI she had met. He said he had left her in the Bournemouth Gardens. DC Souter thanked the captain for his help and he started to leave. When Doreen's sister and father arrived at the station just as Heath was leaving, he stopped to shake his father's hand. The DC had a feeling while watching the man talk with the missing woman's father and Doreen's sister who apparently looked identical to her sister, the gentleman's features looked familiar. It was then he remembered the wanted picture in the police gazette. After double checking, he showed Heath. Heath, after looking for himself, admitted it looked a little bit like him and it had been mentioned before. Souter knew this wasn't possible as the picture hadn't been made public. In the meantime, one of the officers, D.S. Johnson, called Scotland Yard for a more detailed description. Reg Spooner took the call. Once Spooner heard what the D.S. had to say, he did a check on the name Brooke, the identity Heath was using. Once verified, he informed Johnson 
telling him on no account should they let him leave the station. D.S. Johnson and Detective Constable Souter kept Heath talking. They didn't want to lose him. The Metropolitan Police were on their way. Later, Senior Officer D.I. Gates arrived to speak with Heath. He was searched and in his pockets they found four pound notes and some loose change. This, it would be discovered, was what was left after he had pawned Dorian's crystal fob watch and her ring. Heath, Brooks, kept asking for someone to collect his jacket from the hotel as he was cold. Later, when his jacket at the hotel was searched, a return part of a ticket, Bournemouth to London, was found. This had belonged to Doreen. A part of Doreen's pearl necklace would also be found. The cloakroom ticket where Heath had left his suitcase was also discovered. Gates went to the station and retrieved the suitcase. Contained in it was a hat, a label with Heath's name on it and some other labels with his alt names on it, a Mac, a worn leather riding whip with a distinct weave pattern, the same pattern that was found on Marjorie's body, and stains of dry blood could be clearly seen, a blood-stained scarf and neckerchief that had been used for tying. After this discovery, D.I. Gates returned to the station and informed Heath they knew who he was, and Heath went quiet. They detained Heath in connection with the murder of Marjorie Gardner on the night of the 20th of June, 1946. The Metropolitan Police were on their way to interview him. Where was Doreen? When interviewing Heath on the whereabouts of Doreen, he admitted to having met her and went on to make a statement. In it, he explained how he'd met Doreen and how he had left her alive that night. He then claimed to have seen her enter in a shop on the Thursday after they had had dinner and a day after she had disappeared. When D.I. Spooner arrived, he was informed of the findings of the suitcase and of Doreen's disappearance. Spooner and Sims searched the Tollard Royal Hotel room and to their surprise they found 49 ladies' handkerchiefs, all with lipstick stains on them. One of the handkerchiefs had a knot in it with blood stains. It had been cut. Along with this they found two lengths of string. They had also been cut. D.S. Spooner finally came face to face with Heath at the Bournemouth station. He informed Heath that he was investigating the murder of Marjorie Gardner. He said he would make a statement, but he wasn't going to admit to taking Marjorie's life. The next day, Spooner and Sims drove back to London with Heath. Back at Notting Hill Station, they eventually managed to get a statement from Heath. On the Monday, Heath placed himself in position in a lineup of 11 men. The witnesses were brought in one by one and each one of them picked out Heath. Spooner then charged Heath with the murder of Marjorie Gardner at the Pembridge Court Hotel in the night of Thursday the 20th of June to Friday the 21st of June 1946. Outside the West London Magistrates Court a crowd had gathered, apparently many of them being middle-aged women. Heath was remanded until the 23rd of July, then taken to Brixton Prison, where he would stay on remand. Back in Bournemouth, they now felt that Doreen was no longer alive, so they began searching for a body. Doreen had been missing for five days. On Sunday, July the 7th, 1946, Kate Maker, Kathleen Evans, was out walking her dog. She made her usual way down towards the beach at Branksome Dean Chine. Her dog ran ahead. When she caught up with her dog, she noticed a swarm of flies. This bothered her, so she hurried on. The next day, she told her father what she'd seen. The worried man, who had heard of the missing woman, decided to check. They retraced Kathleen's steps, and when there, Mr Evans looked closer. He saw some clothing that seemed to be covering something. The father and the daughter went to the nearest phone box and called the police. Officers from both Bournemouth and Dorset carefully made their way down the footpath. Bishop was led by the Evanses to the spot 
As Bishop got closer, he saw a body. As the light was fading, they put a guard on the site and went the next day. The next morning, the officers that saw Doreen's body were horrified by what they saw. Doreen had been brutally mutilated. She lay naked apart from one shoe. On her left side, blood covered her body. There were signs that her body had been partially concealed. Items were strewn around, including a broken pearl necklace. It matched that of the pearl found in Heath's jacket. Clumps of hair was found that oddly didn't match Doreen's. Was there another body somewhere? This would never be known. It also looked as if the body had been moved to the place that she was found. Doreen's body was moved and a post-mortem started. Her injuries were the result of a frenzied attack. She'd been overpowered by Heath. Her body and face were bruised and cut. She had been bound and gagged, but showed signs of having fought her attacker before being tied up. She had some broken ribs where it's believed Heath used his weight to hold her down. Doreen suffered an horrendous, sadistic attack. The things that were done to this poor girl were so bad that it turned the stomachs of the most hardened of policemen. The brutal, savage mutilation of this poor girl would live with those men for the rest of their lives. She was then dragged into the bushes where her throat was cut and where she was left to die. After such an atrocious attack, why wasn't Heath covered in blood? According to the police, it's believed he stripped off most of his clothes and bathed in the sea after. It's also thought he washed some of his clothing before walking back up the beach. A hotel staff member recalled him asking for his shoes to be polished extra well the next day as he had residue from the beach on them. On the 29th of July 1946, Detective Sergeant Bishop formally charged Heath with the murder of Doreen Marshall. Heath was committed for trial at the Old Bailey for the murder of Marjorie Gardner. After deciding the possibility of Heath getting off with an insanity plea due to the frenzied attack on both the women could possibly confuse the case, they had more chance of a conviction with Marjorie's case first, as the savage killing of Doreen could be implied to have been committed by a lunatic playing into the hands of the defence. At Brixton Prison, while awaiting his trial, Heath made the most of his privileges and revelled in his newfound infamy. The press ran with many stories on an almost daily basis. His name was on everyone's lips. He spent his days eating, smoking, reading and enjoyed expensive food from outside the prison. His friends used his clothing coupons to buy him a suit that met with his requirements for him to wear at court. Women were fascinated by the handsome, well-spoken man and the press played into this by showing the man as a likeable bad boy whose charm and looks had won over those who were around him. This man they had glamorised had brutally and savagely killed two women. Heath's trial began on the 24th of September 1946 at the Old Bailey. Presiding judge was Mr Justice Morris. Appearing for the Crown was Mr Anthony Hawke and Mr Henry Elam. Representing Heath was J.D. Caswell, K.C., Mr Anthony Jessel and Mr McGilvery Asher. He seemed calm, almost relaxed in court. His defence were adamant he would not take the stand to give evidence, as his calm, detached attitude to the murder was eerie, and the jury wouldn't see him as a victim of a mental disease. The man was clearly a psychopath. The women who had been gathering outside the court to get a glimpse of the handsome killer were sat in the courtroom. Heath's defence wanted to show the jury that he wasn't in his right mind that night and didn't know what he was doing. A tactic Heath wasn't fond of, as he didn't particularly want to spend the rest of his life in Broadmoor, but after Cresswell explained that his family would have to live with the fact that these atrocious killings was committed by the man they knew and not someone who wasn't in his right mind, Heath actually cared a great deal for his parents and especially his brother and with this in mind 
He thought about it for a moment before changing his mind and telling them, OK, let's do it. Craswell played heavily on Heath's life, recalling his criminal exploits that were nothing like vicious attacks or violence towards anyone, and that for him to behave in this unusual way, he must have had some sort of mental deficiency. They tried to drive home to the jury that Heath was morally deficient, morally insane, and should therefore be convicted of guilty but insane. They then made a mistake and that they had called upon a psychiatric doctor who was thought to be an extremely credible witness and highly respected, but he was also a morphine addict. Dr W. H. Hubert had injected himself just before he stood as witness to give his professional advice. He was sweating on the stand and seemed very hyper. After a while on the stand, he became confused and unsure of his diagnosis. Anthony Hawke for the Crown wiped the floor with him. The Crown then brought in two psychiatrists from the prison who said Heath wasn't insane but had acted in an abnormal way. Yvonne Simmons was a vital witness for the prosecution. After the trial, Yvonne Simmons left the country for good. On the 27th of September, after Justice Morris summed up the case, the jury went out. About an hour later, they returned with a guilty verdict. Justice Morris donned the black cap and passed the sentence of death. When Heath was asked if he had anything to say, he replied nothing. Although Heath tried to give his life story to the press for a sum, he was blocked from doing so while in remand, but he wrote many letters about his life to his friends that would eventually be put together as a form of life story that the Sunday pictorial would print after Heath's trial. In them he gave his version of what had happened those nights. Why did he do these horrendous things? Why did he snap? It thought that Heath had decided that he had nothing to live for now he had lost everything he'd ever wanted, not only in his professional life, but also his personal life, and his behaviour became increasingly unpredictable. In the condemned cell he made out a will, leaving any money that may have remained to go to his brother, and his caterpillar badge that he held close to his heart was to be sent to his mother. The whole time spent in prison, he refused to see his devoted parents, claiming he wanted them to remember him as they had last seen him outside. On Wednesday the 16th of October 1946, while at least 3,000 people waited outside Pentonville for news of his execution, Heath was offered a shot of whiskey a few minutes before his hanging. Heath replied, while you're about it, sir, you might make it a double. 